So you might be wondering, you know, given I was talking about anxiety and depression and very common issues, how do you determine how much of that is caused by developmental trauma and how much is caused by genetic factors or environmental conditions? It's hard to know. And there is no one right answer, especially across the board. It really varies by from person to person. It has to do with what protective factors they may have in their life. You know, maybe a neighbor next door who was very kind to them um, or a teacher, something like that. Um, it could, and again, genetics can play a part in this. The resilience of the person, you know, how quickly they're able to bounce back. A lot of those things, again, are situational and they vary from person to person. Bottom line, it doesn't necessarily affect how we proceed with treatment um, because therapeutic interventions um, are crucial for addressing both the developmental trauma and the disorder that's presenting in the here and now. So one part of this that's important is that the clinician take a really careful uh, history with the person so that they know what traumas were affecting the client and when. Um, Trauma-focused therapies are very important if in fact there is developmental trauma. Um, these might include somatic experiencing, um, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, better known as EMDR, um, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, um, play therapy, art therapy, there's a number of therapies that are um, really good with addressing trauma um, and the impact of trauma on uh, thoughts, on emotions, and on behaviors. Another piece that personally I think is critical uh, with early, early developmental trauma is therapeutic touch. Um, various touch modalities can be extremely effective in treating developmental trauma, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So establishing a safe, trusting therapeutic relationship is fundamental and reparative because early developmental trauma, attachment trauma, is often at the root of this type of trauma. So providing a supportive environment allows the individual to explore the trauma and develop coping strategies. And it's important also to account for the body's experience um, as an important part of this work. So care should be taken to ask the client to tune into their body to see what the body is wanting when establishing that supportive environment. For example, I like to offer choice when seating. You know, sit wherever it feels comfortable to you rather than where you think you should sit. Or how close or far away would you like me to be from you? Or even a choice of comfort items like throws or pillows. All of that's important in creating a safe therapeutic environment. So regulation and coping skills are going to be the next important part of treating developmental trauma. So uh, the clinician is going to be teaching emotional regulation and coping skills, and that's going to help um, individuals manage distressing and emotions and reactions as they come up. Mindfulness, breathing exercises, grounding techniques, they're all commonly used to regulate emotions and reduce anxiety. So another important tool for regulation is therapeutic touch. The nervous systems of children, especially babies, are very uh, responsive and regulated by uh, touch of the caregiver. So the earlier the trauma, the more important it is to integrate therapeutic touch into the work from, uh, from the provider, specifically trained in working with developmental trauma. So somatic experiencing um, has uh, related touch modalities that are particularly helpful with this kind of work. The TEB work of Stephen Terrell, the SRR work of Kathy Kane and Stephen Terrell, the DARE approach uh, from Diane Poole-Heller, and the neuroaffective touch work of Aileen Lapierre are examples of the kind of developmental trauma uh, focused touch work that is particularly good with this type of trauma.